Thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to start. Today we are going to discuss the uh, patients after total injectomy and radiation therapy. So we are going to discuss a little bit about the surgical technique, the, uh, how we perform the exams, and we are going to see the most common early and late complications. So first, we are going to describe the indication and the indications and the surgical technique that uh, is used for total laryngectomy. We are going to briefly to explain the pathophysiology of the radiation, is radiation chemoradiation therapy uh, in the pharyngeal tissues and swallowing how it modifies the swallowing mechanism, and uh, we will try to provide a basic knowledge and how we perform the postoperative examination of the swallowing, okay? And finally, we are going to describe uh, what are the normal radiographic findings and uh, see some of the early and delay complications, okay? Every slide is a little bit uh, with too much information, but uh, we will go slowly. Okay. The most common cause for total laryngectomy is squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx, okay? It has an estimated overall five-year survival rate of about 70%. So the American Cancer Society estimates something like 13,000 new cases every year. But right now, not all of them, they're going to have total laryngectomy maybe a little bit less than half of them, because now there is a preference for the non-surgical management, okay? Because uh, they try to preserve the organs. The function of those organs preserved uh, is a little bit uh, an issue for discussion. But they try to have a management for organ preservation. So um, <clears throat> after, what is the point for us, the most important information, is that after total laryngectomy, 17% of the patients have dysphagia. So most of them, they have dysphagia. So we have to perform a swallowing examination, okay, to diagnose what is the reason for this dysphagia, and additionally detect the complications of the surgery. So, Going back to the indications of total laryngectomy, in which cases uh, we indicate the total laryngectomy? Well, especially when there is an advanced stage. For example, if there is invasion of the cartilax, there is anterior spread outside of the larynx, there is involvement of the posterior commissure, okay, uh, or bilateral arytenoid joints, okay. If there is a circumferential submucosal in infiltration, or if there is subglottic extension and invasion of the cricoid cartilage. The other possibility for total or indication for total laryngectomy is when in patients with tumors that fail radiation, okay, or they perform previously a partial laryngectomy and it didn't work, okay, if there is a recurrence of the tumor. Sometimes there are advanced extra laryngeal tumors that in, uh, infiltrate the larynx. In some cases, um, the most uh, squamous cell carcinoma is radiosensitive, but there are other laryngeal tumors that they are not so radiosensitive. So in those cases, we have to perform the surgery. Okay, and there are uh, patients with chronic and severe aspiration, okay, or severe necrosis of the larynx. So these are uh, actually the most common indications for total laryngectomy. How we perform the technique? So the technique has two parts. First of all is the resection, and the second one is the reconstruction. The resection is mostly to remove the hyoid bone, the hippiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, 
the true and false vocal folds, the piriform sinuses and ariepiglottic folds, the cricoid cartilag and first tracheal ring. So first is, uh, you know, remove, we remove all these organs, okay? And also we create a tracheostoma, so because uh, the patient is not going to have connection with the GI tract. If there is, uh, for example, local tumor extension or regional lymph nodes, there is an additional radical neck di dissection. Okay, once we resect all these uh, anatomic structures, start re the reconstructions that uh, we call the creation of the re neopharynx. Hmm? So all this anterior defect is closed, okay? So in, multiple, in three layers. The first layer is the mucosal surface. The second layer are the muscles, is the muscles, okay? And finally, the surroundings of tissues. That includes the skin. So this is the reconstruction. reconstruction. In most of the patients, most of the patients, they try to restore the voice. And for that reason, there is a... a the surgeon perform a tracheoesophageal fistula, okay, uh, that goes from the tracheostoma to the uh, anterior wall of the esophagus, and uh, the surgeon plays a prosthesis that later we are going to use for the voice reconstitution. Okay, so this is the surgery. So now let's see a little bit about the radiation changes because most of these patients, they have additional chemo radiation, okay? So um, it has the advantage of preserving the organ's anatomy, but it, produ it produces damages to the organ function as most of our, my residents have seen many times, okay? So in acute stage, there is uh, the radiation produced death of the endothelial cells, okay, of the small blood vessels, and the organs supplied by these damaged vessels will show ischemic changes, chronic ischemic changes. In the mucosal surface, uh, okay, well, uh, there are also, these are the acute complications, but there are also delay complications, okay, as a consequence of the chronic ischemic changes, okay? Um, probably the most important is the replacement of the normal parenchyma, parenchymal tissue by collagen deposition, fibrosis, okay? Because fibrosis and scarring produce, is going to generate the loss of function that we are going to see when we perform the exams. Hmm? And uh, what is the problem is that these adverse effects continue for many years. Even if the patient stops with the uh, radiation, even though you can see that it's becoming, in many cases, worse and worse and worse. Several years after the patient stopped with the radiation. In the mucosa and some mucosa, the chronic ischemia led to atrophy and reduction of the mucosal sensitivity. This is one of the reasons that these patients, they have a delay initiation of the pharyngeal swallow, okay? Uh, if there is uh, injury or fibrosis of the muscularis mucosa, also may produce pharyngeal stricture. In the muscles, okay, there is fibrosis because they are substituted by connective tissues, okay? So this is going to generate weakening, okay, a very weak pharyngeal uh, contraction, and if there was damage of the nerves, also additional uh, uncoordinated contraction. You know that in the GI tract, there is something that we call peristalsis, where you have a proximal contraction, you have a distal distension or relaxation. Well, this kind of peristalsis or coordination is lost after the radiation. Oh, there are additional uh, okay, injuries, for example, the salivary glands. Uh, there is hyposalivation, dry mouth. This produces a lot of problems in the patients to swallow. It's very difficult. Okay. 
how we perform the exam. Okay. Well, the first we can discuss is the uh, what kind of contrast we use. Well, in the early postoperative period, it means in the first four weeks after the surgery, the first swallow should be water soluble contrast or iodinated contrast, what we call usually gastrographin. What is the reason we use this contrast? Because it has better reabsorption than the barium by the neck tissues in case there is a leakage. Okay, so if there is a leakage, the uh, water soluble contrast or the barium in the uh, soft tissues after the leakage, the reabsorption is going to be different. If we do not see contrast extravasation, no leakages, okay, so we continue with barium sulfate. Why? Because it has better radiologic density and coating of the water soluble contrast and also can improve the detection of small leaks that, could, that were missed by the uh, gastrography. In the late postoperative period that we do not suspect a leakages, we try to perform something that is called pharyngography. It means we use a barium sulfate with the maximum concentration for improve the mucosal co coating and the uh, density of the contrast. In those cases, additionally, we perform the modified barium swallowing examination with the assistance of the speech language pathologists because they try multiple barium consistencies, okay, and viscosities for a dynamic functional evaluation. And they try to improve the swallowing of the patient if it's necessary using these different barium consistencies or in some cases, some maneuvers. Any questions? Okay. So, how we perform the examination? Well, first of all, the position of the head is vertical. The patient could be either upright or seated in the swallowing chair. Mm -hmm. We try to perform, in most of the cases, the lateral view. But in some cases, when we are looking for leakages, we have to perform additionally the frontal view because some of the leakages can be missed if they overlap the images, the image of the neopharynx. So we have to perform always lateral and in many cases also additionally a frontal view. The exposure time, since this is a very dynamic process, have to be as short as possible. This is the reason we use high KV, trying to short the exposure time. Because when we short the exposure time, the quality, the resolution of the image is, images is much better. Mm -hmm. So we record these images uh, as a video, 30 frames per second, or in some cases that we need better resolution as a rapid digital sequences or um, Okay, so we take pictures about eight frames per second. Based on what we are looking for, if we are mostly looking for a functional disorder or anatomic disorder, we decide which one of them. In the daily practice, we usually record using both systems, okay? Most of the patients will record the images on both systems, okay? So the normal image of the neopharynx, okay, is an inverted cone-shaped structure like here, okay? In some cases, uh, at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment, there is an anterior displacement of the posterior wall. We are going to discuss in detail later. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to tell you what are the most common complications after total laryngectomy and radiation, Okay, the early complications that we mentioned, uh, oh, I'm sorry. First, leakages, okay, that produce sinus tracts, abscess formation, could be a pharyngocutaneous fistula, is very frequent, okay, hematomas, and of course, swallowing disorders. The later complications, okay, in most of the cases we have swallowing disorders, we are going to discuss today the, what is the pseudohypiglottis. I'm going to show you some cases of dysmotilities of the dorsum of the tongue 
and uh, the pharynx, okay? And uh, in some cases, there is nasal regurgitation, cricopharyngeal dysfunction. This is a very important topic right now with the, related with the voice reconstitution of the patients. It's a new topic, at least for us. And of course, since the patient has radiation and they can have ischemic changes also due to the surgery, we are going to evaluate for strictures and of course, tumor recurrence. Okay, so we are going to start with the first complication. Any question about the previous, uh, how we performed the examination, the contrast? Okay, so leakages, sinus tract, and pharyngocutaneous fistula. They are the most co frequent complications after total laryngectomy uh, with an average frequency of 16%. But after uh, important resections, when the resection was, is large, for example, because it failed uh, radiation or partial laryngectomy, something that is called salvage, salvage total laryngectomy, it rise to 34%. So you can see that it's quite frequent. Yes, sir. Uh, when you give the barium, um, how do you avoid the barium backing up to the ostomy on the, on the, on the anterior aspect of the neck and on these patients with total laryngectomy? Well, how, how do you do that? Like you, you swallow it and then the contrast goes to the hole? No? Yeah. So that doesn't happen. No, I, I don't understand the question. How, how we? These are patients with total laryngectomy, yes. right? They have this ostomy, uh, tracheostomy. Yes. And the there cannula. There is no connection between both. There is no connection between tracheostomy so and they the. They don't have a connection. No. The no. only connection is the fistula for the. If uh, they have a fistula. Well, okay. You are talking about if there is a fistula, usually the fistula doesn't go to the trachea. It's extremely rare. Okay. The surgeon can produce a fistula to place a, a prosthesis for the voice reconstitution. And of course, in some cases, there are, I will show you some cases later. But usually, there is no connection between the neopharynx yeah. and the trachea. Yeah. Usually, no. Okay. But if you, if there is, it's very easy to make the diagnosis. It's very easy. Okay. And uh, barium is not, uh, is not a big issue for the uh, airway. Okay. Yeah. I hope I, <laughs> this was the right answer. Okay. So what are the risk factors? Okay. Infection. Okay previous radiotherapy, okay, the healing after previous radiotherapy is impaired, okay, neck dissection, positive tumor margins, okay, blah, 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 okay, and in some cases, maybe due to tumor recurrence in the late postoperative period, okay. So how can we make the detection of these abnormalities? Well, sinus tracts are blind outpouchings outside the lumen of the neopharynx, we have to know how to recognize what is a post-surgical change and what is really outside of the lumen, okay? And the uh, second one, the pharyngocutaneous fistula that is the most common, are communications between the anterior wall of the neopharynx and the skin surface. I think on Monday we saw one interesting case, okay? But it was uh, within the soft tissues of the neck, very severe case. Okay, these are some cases that I select to show you how we see the sinus tracts and the pharyngocutaneous fistula. So you see some contrast outside the lumen, like here, for example, there, okay, or in the frontal view, this one, on the left side of the patient. When they connect to the skin, you are going to see that the contrast in this area goes into the skin, like here, Okay. In some cases, like in the case we saw on Monday, we had to check after the patient swallowed because we saw contrast going everywhere. So we stopped and tried to visualize the neck. Since we didn't see anything, 
any burial in the neck of the patient, we assume that was a sinus tract, okay? Otherwise, but personally, I suspect was a fistula. Okay, this is another fistula. Some of them, they are very large, and they stay a long time uh, to heal, especially if the patient had previous radiation. Other complications are the bleeding and hematomas, okay? So usually we see as an enlargement of the soft tissues and displacement and narrowing of the pharyngeal lumen, okay? This is a typical case. So you see that there is a anterior displacement of the lumen. So you have to suspect here that there is a mass effect. So possibilities could be a hematoma or could be also an abscess okay, in the early postoperative period, okay? This was a hematoma. Okay, this is another complication. It's frequent and produces a lot of problems, and it's very difficult to solve. They are the anterior pharyngeal pouches, okay? So also they have uh, other synonyms, like pharyngeal pseudo-diverticulum, anterior diverticulum of the neopharynx. Um, I will show you the image first, okay? So this is the swallowing, and you see a pouch here between the dorsum of the tongue and the neopharynx, okay? So let's go back. So it's a pocket or outpouching anterior, uh, in the anterior wall between the base of the tongue and the reconstructed pharynx, okay? So the patient have uh, dysphagia, regurgitation, and the feeling of a foreign body. What is the problem? Why this is generated? Because this is an area of weakness without muscular layer. There is only mucosa and skin. So there is no, every time there is an increase in the pressure when the patient tries to swallow, there is pushing of the bolus through this weak area. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there is, as I told you, localized weakness because there is absence of the muscular layer, okay? So there is lack of tonicity, and every time the patient swallow, there is an increase in the pressure and pushing through that area, okay? With uh, multiple swallowings, this area is larger and becomes larger, and finally, the patient can develop a pharyngocutaneous fistula, because this area is increased with time. Okay, and uh, this is one of the complications. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this is due to, a, for example, a more distal obstruction, mechanical obstruction, or sometimes can be due to dysmotilities of the pharynx. So the patient push with the dorsum of the tongue, and the pharynx do not open at the same time. And this produces a localized increase in the pressure, and this, okay, Okay, this is the radiographic image that we expect to see. This is the dorsum of the tongue, this is the neopharynx, and this is the pouch, okay? So after the swallowing, there is residue here, is pooling of contrast or food, and this produces a lot of problems. Symptoms, and especially, you are going to see at the end of the presentation that it can produce changes in the voice, the voice of the patient. So it's an issue that uh, the surgeons have to address. Okay, any question about this? So in most of the cases, after the patient swallow, you can see retained food or contrast in this area. And this, unfortunately, becomes larger and larger with time. So this is one of the complications, okay? The other complications I'm going to show you is something that is called pseudohypiglottis. I will show you the image. When the patient swallow, appears to be a uh, linear defect here between the dorsum of the tongue and the neopharynx that appears to be a hypiglottis. But since the patient has no hypiglottis, but looks like it's called pseudohypiglottis. It's a fold of mucosa at the base of the tongue, okay, that comes from the side of the pharynx. This linear defect, okay, 
that is seen in the anterior wall, okay, is what we call that, okay? We don't know in many cases what is exactly the reason, okay, for this, or, okay, for this abnormality. But uh, in some cases, they mention that it's associated with a surgical defect or vertical closure of the, when they perform the reconstruction, okay? So every, what is interesting in this case is that you cannot see this abnormality when the patient is in resting position, when the patient is not swallowing. So you perform, for example, the endoscopy, and you don't see any abnormality. But when the patient swallow with a contraction of the neopharyngeal walls, in that moment, it produces the uh, blockage for the uh, pseudo epiglottis. So it's something that can be detected only when we evaluate the swallowing of the patient. Mm -hmm. Cannot be seen by laryngoscopy, or by, uh, sorry, by pharyngoscopy or by uh, endoscopy. Mm -hmm. So the consequence is that just obstruction, okay? So there is obstruction at the entrance of the neopharynx, okay? And this is one of the reasons that uh, the, of the anterior pharyngeal pouches, because the obstruction produces increased pressure, and the increased pressure push the, uh, and enlarge the pouches. Mm -hmm. So this is the typical image. This is the dorsum of the tongue. This is the neopharynx, and this linear defect, okay, is the, what we call the pseudo epiglottis. It's very frequent very frequent. We see many cases after the surgery, okay? But in some cases, the uh, blockage is more significant than in others. In other, in some cases, they have to perform a surgery to uh, relieve this obstruction, otherwise the patient cannot swallow. So they are severe cases. This is one of the cases. For example, here, you can see the pseudo hippiglottis while the patient is swallowing. And this anterior protrusion is the pharyngoesophageal segment. Okay, let's go to other uh, motility disorders. Oop, trying to see my, okay. So, what is the reason there are motility disorders in the neopharynx after the total anejectomy? Okay, because first of all, there is resection of some structures that support the dorsum of the tongue and the pharyngeal muscle. And second one, when they perform the surgery, there is damage of the pharyngeal muscles and nerves by the tumor, by the surgery, or by radiation. For any reason, there are motility disorders, okay? So the functional consequences is that, for example, the posterior backward movement of the dorsum of the tongue is limited or weak, okay? The pharyngeal walls, contractions, they are weak, and they are especially non-coordinated, okay? Even in some cases, severe cases, there is reverse peristalsis. That's the reason the patient, after swallow, they have regurgitation. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is an increased outflow resistance across the pharyngoesophageal junction, okay? What is the problem? That there is going to be a lot of residue after swallowing, okay? And this is going to generate the patient's complaint, okay? That they have regurgitated food, they have, etc. Okay, so how can we detect these motility disorders? Well, these three first images are during the swallowing, and this is after swallowing. You can see that when the patient is swallowing, you see a dilation here. This is a limited opening of the neopharynx. But you see that in some moment, this area during the passage of the bolus close and generates some pooling of contrast in this area. This is a typical dysmotility of the neopharynx. We have to expect the closing after the tail of the bolus went into the esophagus, but no, it's before that. So some contrast is going to be trapped within the proximal part of the neopharynx. Mm -hmm. So in this case, as I told you, there is a luminal narrowing, the contractions are weak, 
and they are non-peristalsis, peristaltics, okay? So after swallowing. Okay, in some cases, due either to the stricture of the neopharynx or the motility disorder, we expect to see some nasal regurgitation, as you can see here, okay? This is the soft palate, this is the dorsum of the tongue, this is the neopharynx, and due to the poor coordination, some contrast has difficulties to go down, so goes up into the nasal fossa. This is other of the complications. In this particular case, you can see that there is a leakage of contrast uh, outside of the neopharyngeal walls. Mm -hmm. This is better. Okay. Okay. One of the important abnormalities after the total laryngectomy is the dysfunction of the pharyngoesophageal segment. This is very important. I will explain you why. It's a, you know, what is the reason of the, I will show you first the image, okay? This is the image. So you have an anterior protrusion of the posterior pharyngeal wall. This is what we call dysfunction of the pharyngoesophageal segment, and this area do not open in the moment that the bolus goes down, so produce a mechanical obstruction. So, it's uh, impairment of the pharyngeal propulsion, okay, due to poor contraction and peristalsis. One of the reasons that this area opens is the high pressure of the bolus that is generated by the contraction of the dorsum of the tongue and the pharyngeal wall. But if you have a poor contraction and poor coordination, the pressure inside the bolus is going to go decrease. And this is going to be one of the reasons that this area do not open properly. Mm -hmm. Additionally, in this area, there was a resection of the cricoid cartilag. So there is a narrowing of this area because just the cricopharyngeus, okay, attach with itself anteriorly. Same happens with the other muscle. So there is a narrowing in this area, okay? And of course, could be an additional damage of the muscles and nerves, okay? And synchronization of all these structures, okay? Additionally, could be fibrosis, okay? Due to the, as we mentioned, ischemia after the surgery or radiation. Okay. So we see as an anterior displacement, as we mentioned before, okay, blah, blah, blah. So why this is so important? Well, first of all, because it produces an obstruction to the flow. But there is another problem right now. When uh, they start with the voice reconstitution of the patient, okay, this is the area that generates sometimes the sound, okay? So the patient uh, send uh, the air from the tracheostoma into the esophagus, goes up, okay, and try to move this area to generate some vibration. So the position and the shape of this area is very important for the voice generation. And I think in the future, when we work in this area, we will have to measure exactly the protrusion and compare with the other parts of the neopharynx in order to know if the voice of the patient is going to be normal or not. So it's becoming complicated. This is another case with insufficient opening of the uh, pharyngoesophageal segment. And of course, you can see that there is an early contraction of the upper part of the neopharynx and residue, okay, in this area, in the pouch. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Additionally, you can have benign stricture due to radiation or due to the surgery. I will show you some of them. Okay, for example, here, you have a case where you can see multiple uh, narrowings of the lumen here also, okay? This is a pseudo epiglottis, okay? So you see multiple narrowings, and I have many cases of narrowing. 
I think most of them are due to radiation. This is also a, a protrusion of the neopharyngeal segment, okay, here, here. So you see that the benign strictures, they are very frequent. We have to evaluate the severity in order that the uh, otolaryngologists decide what they are going to do with these patients, what is the treatment they are going to use with these patients. This is a very interesting uh, topic, at least for us, is the tracheoesophageal fistula creation between the uh, trachea and the esophagus for voice restoration. They place a prosthesis, okay, and try to perform the speech rehabilitation of the patient. So they place a prosthesis, okay, after they perform the fistula during the surgery. And this, as I told you before, the, the patient inspirates, block this area, the air goes this way, vibrate in this area, and uh, there is an emission of the voice. So what is the problem we have to evaluate when we perform these exams? Well, if there is a mechanical obstruction here, the patient is going to have problems for the voice. And also, if there is uh, uh, pouches or areas where the fluids are contained, the voice is going to change. So this is another problem that most of the patients have. So when we perform the exam, we have to check the position of the prosthesis and check for complications. So we have to perform the examination during one swallowing cycle to see how is the position of the tube in the esophageal lumen, okay? And also we have to evaluate the voice attempts of the patient and see uh, if there is any complication. I will show you some complications. For example, when the patient swallow, you can see that there is a displacement, okay, of the anterior uh, part of the prosthesis, okay, that goes into the esophageal lumen. What is the consequence? The patient will have dysphagia because this is going to produce a mechanical obstruction. Hmm? The other complication we saw not long time ago is when the device goes into the lumen of the trachea, like this case. So the patient has problems to breathe and of course, for voice rehabilitation. The other complication is when we have leakages either through or around the prosthesis, okay? So what is the consequence? When they are through the prosthesis, it, this indicates that the prosthesis needs a replacement for one that uh, works properly, or when the uh, leakages are around the prosthesis, they need a larger prosthesis to prevent these complications. You can see here that the prosthesis, the contrast goes from the esophagus into the tracheal lumen, same as you see here. But in this case, it's around the prosthesis. So to perform these exams, is lateral view is complicated. Usually we try to perform an oblique view in order to see this lower part that is a little bit below the pharyngoesophageal segment. And do not forget to obtain these pictures during the whole swallowing cycle. Mm -hmm. This is, I will show you some cases with multiple complications. For example, this is a patient with a total laryngectomy. You can see that there is a narrowing here, probably due to scarring. You can see that there is leakage into the posterior or retropharyngeal space and additional a fistula. I think this is the case that uh, you asked me. I think, or the question you asked me. How do you evaluate this? Okay, here you have a fistula between the upper esophagus, okay, and the trachea. Mm -hmm. This is another case with uh, three complications. So this is an anterior pharyngeal pouch, okay, with uh, retained, with pulling of contrast. This is the pseudo epiglottis, looks like to be an epiglottis, and this is the protrusion of the pharyngoesophageal segment. So you don't expect to see only one complication. You can see multiple 
when you perform the swallowing, okay? Well, in the conclusion, okay? So the fluoroscopic examination is still the gold standard for evaluation, especially of the motilities and normalities of the pharynx. And in most of the cases for also the anatomic abnormalities, especially when there is a stricture, okay? It's uh, useful for detection, characterization, and also estimation of severity, the most common early and late postoperative complication, okay? So additionally, we perform these exams with the speech language pathologies, what we call modified virion swallow, in order to try different bolus uh, viscosities and therapeutic maneuvers to determine the patient oral intake capabilities, okay, if the patient can swallow normally or not. Okay, questions? Questions? You have to know how to perform this exam and make the diagnosis. There's no way we can uh, ask for an endoscopy in those patients. We'll have to know how to make it and make the diagnosis. There's no choice. In some cases, you can say, okay, I recommend an endoscopy, I recommend a CT, I recommend whatever. In this case, you cannot. So please study. <laughs> that prevents them from getting the voice after they make a fistula through the stomach. What do they do to fix that, or is it just... Okay. Uh, which... Uh, yeah, the pest. The pseudo... Uh, ah, okay, okay, okay. Give me one second. I think this, yes, exactly. Well, this is, well, it's very interesting. This is very protruded, okay? They can cut. But if it's too, uh, you know, too weak, they cannot do anything. Yes, 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 it's exactly. Yes, yes, it's a cricopharyngeal bar after surgery. And the reason, as I explained you, is that here they eliminate the cricoid cartilage. So this area is narrowing. But during the surgery, they have to evaluate this area carefully, if they cut or not. It's a very difficult decision, and sometimes they need some specific measurements, okay, uh, to know if they have to cut or what kind of therapy they have to do. But this is very important. Because otherwise, the patient cannot uh, have a voice reconstitution. This is the area that generate, that vibrates with the ear. Do they ever get swallow studies prior to surgery for a baseline? I don't them? think so. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Maybe. Yeah, probably, but uh, it's a good, too good question. <laughs> for example, if you are going to perform, uh, for example, surgery for uh, reflux, I tell you, yes, because the surgery is going to be uh, decided what kind of surgery based on the preoperative findings. But in this case, I think maybe CT or MR is more important. They want to know the location of the tumor and the histology of the tumor more than how is the swallowing. Even though sometimes they request this examination just for general information. And after the tell you, for example, after the swallowing, oh, the patient cannot swallow well. Well, he couldn't swallow well before the surgery, something like that. But I'm not sure, it's a very good question. I have to think about that. I don't know either. Questions? Thank you for your Thank you.